Hello, and welcome to the Humumu Halloween Home Horror Hoedown. The podcast where we watch 31 horror movies throughout the hallowed month of October. Ranging from the critically acclaimed to film school projects gone gruesomely awry. And we take them all way too seriously. I'm your host, Mike Hummel. And I'm your host, Sully Hummel. Now warning, we use a ghoulish number of spoilers, so watch the movies first. Second warning, we don't know anything about anything, so don't take us seriously while we take these movies seriously. A special treat for today's listeners. We're going all the way back to the oldest film we have ever covered, The Village of the Damned from 1960, a classic a classic indeed. In fact, I made the request to watch a movie with creepy kids in it. And uh, this was the one you came up with. Yeah, I gave you a whole list, but this was... You were excited to see a classic. Yeah, I. there's something about going back to those, like original scary stories or the some you know the ones that did something for the first time or you know i don't know that this did anything for the first time but it's definitely a well-known recognizable name in horror stories yeah that we have never seen so now we have now we have tell us a little bit about what the story is well at 11 a.m one day make sure we know that it's 11 a.m yes Everybody falls asleep for hours and hours. Then they wake up. All the women in town are now pregnant. Boom. And then eventually those kids are born and they are creepy kids. And yes. so we deal with the creepy kids. Yes. This story follows this particular town, but it, we also hear throughout the course of the movie that um, there were, what, f- seven other, um, They in this one they call them um, timeout groups of children this happened all over the place yes so basically the movie is this scientist who happens to be the uh quote-unquote father of one of the surprise children (laughs) he is trying to figure out where they came from and, and and trying to develop a connection with them a rapport with them while basically the rest of the village is like uh they're terrible they gots to go yeah, there's not a lot of support for these kids. In fact, there's an angry, torch-wielding mob, even, which is fun. Yes, yes. They they literally are so upset about what these children are doing. I mean, maybe rightfully so. But they're so upset that they just, like, grab handfuls of straw from from the ground and light them on fire and march as a group yeah. to the the building where they're being schooled. Yeah, you would think you'd burn yourself real bad if you held a handful of hay that was on fire, but this was dampened hay, perhaps? I don't know. It it seemed to keep them safe. Perhaps. I don't know. It it seemed like they did sort of do half of the job of the children for them, because by the time they got there, like, really, all David had to do was, like, give him a little bit of the eyeball power. And (laughs) uh, the lead rabble-rouser dropped their flaming straw and and lit themselves on fire so yeah and i guess burned up we didn't see that because this is 1960 but yes seemed to be the implication that was just one of the many things that these children did to these villagers whenever they were angry in any way i i mean i get why the villagers were rabble rousing yeah there was an element where the kids were definitely just defending themselves basically they never really instigated anything they would just people would come at them and they'd be like meow, 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 with their eyes it would they would suddenly <laughs> become still photographs yes <laughs> they were and even from the very beginning but i think the problem is you know i think in any case where there's somebody who's born with supernatural powers like uh charlie from firestarter Carrie from Carrie. Just anybody from any Stephen King Basically story. Basically any child born in a Stephen King story. Or even if we go to X-Men, uh, what's her face? The one who can't touch people. <laughs> Rogue. Rogue. They all act out of self-defense when they're infants and cause harm to the people that are trying to protect them. 
And it sort of sets them up for this antagonistic relationship, even though that was pure, like it was just instinct. It's not like they weren't trying to be bad in those early instances. They weren't trying to do anything aggressive. Their bodies were just protecting them. And the same thing happens here. These kids, like really early on, uh, the mom of David, like doesn't check the bottle and gives him a bottle that's too hot. He gets mad and he like makes her stick her hand in the bottle warmer and scowled herself over and over again. It sounds terrible. It sounds really aggressive and, and abusive. He was a baby. But exactly. He was an infant and he was mad. Like you give those really super powerful powers to somebody who doesn't have reasoning thought in their brains mm-hmm. or doesn't understand like maybe the maybe the alien brain was in infant david and was retaliating but because they didn't understand how humanity worked yet i don't yeah. know it, it's all it's very interesting but but all of that is to say that long before they were really making choices about what to do within their role in the village they had already created this antagonistic relationship with the villain. Yeah, they were off on the wrong foot. I mean, they were on the wrong foot before they were ever born because mm-hmm. all the guys in town were like, why is my wife pregnant? And it was all right, very the guy, awkward. <laughs> the guy who comes back after a year at sea to find out his wife is <laughs> pregnant yes. was not thrilled. That was something I was just thinking about before we, re- we recorded this, where I was like, you know, I know this is a classic, and I'm the worst person to see classics because it's just, I think it's terrible. Like, not, not that this is a terrible movie, but, like, the acting in movies of this caliber is so terrible. The guy who had been away for a year and has found out his wife was pregnant, so obviously assumed she had been cheating on him, he did this angry face at her. <laughs> it's just so dumb. He didn't even say a single line in the whole movie, I don't think. I think he just stared at her in angsty sea voyager rage. Yes, that's seaman rage. And then stormed out of the house. Yeah. I, I also was thinking about how when you go into the Wayback Machine and you watch movies from a long time ago, it, it's a little rough. Like... And and not to say that this wouldn't happen now if this same situation came up, but the assumption was that all of these women, like every woman in town, <laughs> turns out pregnant at the same time, and they're still all going, well, they must have been having sex out of marriage, and they must have been having, you know, it must be the woman's fault. And all I could think was, really, dude? <laughs> really? There's no other, like, this isn't flipping any other switches in your brain every single woman cheated on either their spouse or god's law at the exact same time I come mean, on I, I think they were quickly going to this is a weird situation and we're moving resources in to try to manage this and it was awkward though it Definitely was very awkward. awkward there's just such an element of misogyny in that Especially coming from the priest, who was all like, you know, she said it couldn't have happened any other way. And The priest. But, and I'm like, dude, your entire religion is built around a woman saying that she got pregnant without having sex. Like, that's, yeah, get that's with the program. The <laughs> that priest who was like, I can't tell you things about people, you know, confidentiality. And they're like, come on, dude. And he's like, well, okay, you know the 17-year-old in town. <laughs> And he just starts naming names. Yeah, he was he was not good at his job in a lot of ways. No, he had some issues. Oh, so you're talking about you were talking about the acting. Yeah. And again, the time period that it's from, like I not having been around in the sixties and not having watched a lot of these movies, I don't know for sure, but there it feels to me like especially the men all their acting was so subdued, like they weren't yeah. allowed to express emotions. Yeah, which is funny when the plot was that these kids have no emotions. <laughs> right. Like, are you sure? They seem just like you. <laughs> yes. And so it was just, it was so weird that like, that you would have to guess. They would, the, the men would just sort of get this like weird constipated look on their face and you would have to guess. I don't know. Are you mad? Are you sad? Are you 
confused? Are you scared? I don't know. Like, have an emotion, man. Yeah. That was part and parcel to the feeling I was getting from this movie, especially at the beginning. This was a 50s monster movie, you know, which fundamental to those kind of movies is this whole idea that it's not a personal story. It's just like, let's see how the government and scientists and the military work together to handle this weird situation. And the beginning of this movie was all that, you know, they were mobilizing the troops and doing research, metal detecting the ground (laughs) to see if they found some interesting metals. Oh, one of my, one of my all caps notes is, (laughs) did they not know about the scientific method in 1960? They didn't. Because their way of figure, first of all, they find a crashed bus and a cop passes out, <laughs> and immediately they, like, put up fencing around the entire village. Yeah, I guess. And I'm like, well, that seems like an extreme reaction. Yeah. And then <laughs> they're doing all this testing. They're, like, sticking the canary into the space so it, it passes out, and then pull it out, and it comes back to life. And a guy walks in, and he passes out, and they pull him out, and he comes back to life. And this whole time... The cop that they watched fall down, they just leave him in there. Yeah, he's fine. They could have used a long stick to grab him (laughs) and pull him out, but no, no, he, they just left him in there until 3 p.m. when everybody woke up all at once. Yeah, well, lucky that happened eventually because. Yeah. They also sent a plane in to go ahead and crash. Right? Yes, because the best way to conduct a scientific experiment is in a propeller plane way up in the air. A a scientific experiment that you know from previous scientific experiments will result in someone passing out. Yeah. I mean, he he was literally the only fatality of the whole knockout time. Yeah, it was weird that nothing bad really happened to anybody there, except they spilled a lot of water in the uh, general store. There was a lot of water. The the part that (laughs) made me realize, I actually had the thought, I'm like, oh, I am not watching a Stephen King story right now was early on when they all passed out, you saw that one of the housewives had been ironing. And so her yeah. iron is sitting like I hot side down on a piece of cloth. And I was like, Oh, that's not going to be good. But four hours later she wakes up and it's fine. Like it fine. I, I think her, her dress, dress was, did it ruin her dress? Yeah, she said her favorite blue dress was ruined. Not that you could tell by looking. So it was only <laughs> ruined right immediately underneath yeah. where the iron yeah, is. Yeah, it was just that spot. Yeah. If this had been a Stephen King story, that iron would have started a fire that would have burned down the whole town and, like, they all would have died. I mean, they would have had to leave some for the story. Most of them would have died. Speaking of Stephen King stories, that's immediately under the dome came to mind for the whole beginning of this movie. I'm like, oh, yeah. This is so very much that. I read Under the Dome, and I don't remember it, and I think I've blocked it from my memory because I was so annoyed. Like, the thing I remember when I think about Under the Dome is how annoyed I was that I read a book that weighed, like, 45 pounds. It was big. To get to what was essentially a joke. Yeah, the uh, the magical explanation, the sci-fi explanation for that one was, yikes. I did not like that at all. And it was very disappointing after all the story, which I found very interesting, the story, as they went in. But it felt like that at the beginning here, even though this is a yeah. whole different ballpark of what what's going on. Yeah. Speaking of science, uh, while they were doing their research, the scientists and the military and stuff, they basically were like, is it metal? No. (laughs) Is it radioactive? No. Then they were all like, "Mm, I don't know. Like, literally, the metal detector... they also considered it could be gas. The metal detector and the Geiger counter were the only two machines they had. (laughs) Again, what was going on back in the 60s, folks? Not much. (laughs) I guess not. Um, One thing that was going on was ugly kids. Because the uh, the weird alien kids looked more normal than the human kids that were making fun of them. So I kind of felt bad for that. I mean, they didn't look normal, though. No, they did not look normal. They looked like the cast of Sound of Music. <laughs> I'm pretty sure those are supposed to be normal-looking kids, too. Well, Depends they looked, on where you live. The thing is, they looked very Aryan. Yes, and that got me thinking, just 
when we first started recording this, I was like, 1960. Mm-hmm. Maybe they were thinking back and they're like, what's scarier than the Aryan super soldiers coming to fruition in your town? Possibly. I had a less charitable interpretation of that, probably because I am like neck deep in reading Stamped from the Beginning. Yeah. And my thought was more that the idea was these aliens had tried to like create the best specimen, the the highest performing specimen Yikes. of the species that was on this planet. Like and that this was what the directors and writers came up with. They're yeah. like, oh, if aliens wanted to make the most the most gene because everything else about them they de- they developed quickly they were super smart you know they yeah. had superpowers you know if aliens wanted to have the strongest best children they could possibly make obviously they would be blonde haired and blue eyed right blonde haired and glow eyed uh, yeah I mean when their eyes weren't glowing though I'm pretty sure they were blue maybe. I don't know, black and white. But, I mean, that, you know, who knows what was actually going on. I wasn't in the room while they were making those decisions, but they did very intentionally choose very Scandinavian-looking children. Oh, yeah, that was definitely a theme there, which may have come from the book Midwitch Cuckoos, on which this was based, The Midwitch Cuckoos. And I had the thought at the beginning of the movie, wish I had researched it before I said it on this you know, world-renowned podcast to thousands and thousands of listeners. Yes. But I think that cuckoos are much like cowbirds in that they steal other birds' nests and make other birds raise their young. Oh, I think you're right. Yeah, that's And that makes, think. yes, that makes this make a lot more sense. Yeah, so that's a thing. I still think it's racist. Cuckoos? I mean, I'm just saying the way the story was presented. Oh, I, I, sure. that doesn't change my mind sure. about the whole Aryan. No, thing, no, but, I was just. But I was yes, just connecting I, that. I, I, I think you are right about that, and that, uh, that's interesting. That makes a lot of sense in Which the context. Is why, in some ways, this movie reminded me of one we watched recently. Didn't do for the podcast, Vivarium. Yes, that uh, is very similar, actually. Although this this was a much more subdued film than Vivarium, which was madness. Yeah, it got a little nuts. Yeah. So let's talk about Gordon for a minute. Um, Gordon is the sciencey dad of David, one of the cuckoos. <laughs> and he's like I mentioned before, he's the only one who who doesn't like he advocates from the very beginning that we they need to get to know them, they need to learn about them, yeah. they need to learn from them. Like he sees these children as a wealth of information while everyone else sees them as a threat. Yeah. So how did that work out for him? Well, that's the funny thing about it, is if you think of it in terms of the movie is the movie's message then that you shouldn't bother trying to, you know, find things out or anything. You should just go ahead and shoot first. Uh, especially if they look very different from you. Come on. Which kind of goes with your interpretation of the Aryanism, I suppose. I mean, the 1960s, man. There was a lot going on with that stuff. There was, for sure. Um, I mean, I shouldn't even say the 1960s because this is 1960. So really, this the was 50s. from the 1950s. Yeah. The, these thoughts that were driving this movie are from the 50s. Yeah, and, yeah which is that's, pretty scary. Yeah. 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 So maybe that was their idea. If somebody looks different than you, you just better kill them. Just don't, don't I mean, take a chance. So he was the equivalent. Like you said, this was a monster movie. Mm-hmm. And he was the scientist at the beginning who's always like ranting and raving about what's going on and everyone disregards them. Yeah. That was who he was. Now, he also turns out to be the one, like, he changes his tune. Yeah, which is different than most monster movies. Usually that guy is right, and the whole system is wrong, and he's going to be a hero. Right. He still turns out, like, he still is the hero. Yeah, he's the hero, but by agreeing with yes general policy. I mean, again, maybe that's because those environmental movies came later yeah. uh what we watched frog frogs. last year and that was oh frogs which was about toads um <laughs> and alligators and, and snapping turtles essentially every every animal except frogs Fox. but 
those movies, I think that was from 1968, if I'm remembering correctly. I don't remember. And like those environmental movies came a little bit later. So this was actually probably very early on. And the idea that you, that, that society would realize you were right and change to meet you, like that was a really bizarre idea. And so in this case, he presents this information, but he's shown the error of his ways. <laughs> and then get in line. <laughs> and then, uh, basically has to sacrifice himself to save the village from this evil that he brought in, t- you know, that he allowed to grow yeah. up in, inside. Instead of nuking it from orbit, which is the only way to be sure. It is the only way. Uh, I mean, really, he sacrificed himself so that the village didn't get nuked from orbit, because I'm pretty sure that's what they were thinking about doing. Yeah, that was the next step. What's sad is that does sound like a crazy fantasy today as well, the idea that you could make a difference to how society is thinking. I mean, yeah. As we see over and over again, like more and more and more pictures coming from the West Coast yeah. where it looks like a post-apocalyptic wasteland with the with the smoke and everything. I just, I actually just heard that some of the schools are, they're sending the kids home because the schools, the air in the schools is so terrible that they, it's not safe to keep the kids there. So, I mean, yeah. although at that point I'm like, well, is the air in their homes any better? <laughs> Hopefully but they got better I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, it, it is, it is hard to imagine these days society swinging around to believe what scientists tell them. Yeah. To as be like, we, I'll listen to these warnings. Right. As, as you know, we're having the earliest snow we've ever had in Colorado and more fires than we've ever had along the West coast and hurricanes, hurricanes, there was massive flooding on the East coast. And at the same time, we're now, Seven plus months, well, nine months into a pandemic, and we're still trying to convince people that masks are important. We're not making headway. It's going backwards. I mean, it. Yeah, it's. um, Yeah, Yeah. it's this. This movie probably captures human behavior better than any of the movies that have been made since then. (laughs) In terms of this, so. We're here in our little podcasting studio bathroom where we're surrounded by cozy blankets. And I'm going to stay in here from now on. This is our bunker. You can bring me meals. Okay. I mean, it won't, like, protect us from literally anything. But we won't see it's what's a, going on it's outside. A blanket fort. Yeah. <laughs> That's what feels good about it. It does feel good, doesn't it? Yeah. We even just put a um, towel across the top. To, you know, like buffer the echo from the ceiling. And yeah, it sort of feels more protective. Yeah, we're nice and safe. <sighs> One thing I do want to add is that the two women who I think they both work in the general store are named Plumpton and Ogle. I felt like that was important to note. Yeah. It, yeah. I don't know if that's just make, makes this a crazy movie or if just, you know, British. This is a British movie. That, I mean, it, that just might be it. That it just sounds, those, those names are possibly perfectly normal and we're not <laughs> used to them because they're perfectly normal in a different culture. That's funny. I had forgotten that this took place in England. You would think that uh, Middle, yeah. Middle Witch would have given it away, but. Well, they, in the 60s and the 50s, I guess, it sounded kind of the same in American movies, you know? They yeah. did that kind of thing. Yeah. The Mid Atlantic accent. Although honestly, I watch, I'm I'm watching a series that's like uh, modern retellings of Miss Marple stories by Agatha Christie, mm-hmm. and and it's current. Like these are new. I'm I'm seeing actors where I'm like, I know that guy. Like this is not old. It's just new people tell retelling old stories, and it takes place back in like the 50s, maybe even the 40s, and they also all the acting is very flat and like. Huh. It's not as flat as this movie, but it's it's it feels very flat to me. So maybe that's a British thing. Oh, I don't know. I mean, that's not how Sherlock is, and that's my standard for British television. <laughs> that's true. It's possible that they're recreating that idea of yeah, like how 
people talk about the old days as being black and white and yes. they always make everybody very stodgy and stuff and yeah or you know that there was more of this idea that you didn't wear your heart on your sleeve you didn't express yourself yeah. as much you know you kept everything inside and then so if you wanted to express something you had to do it like with an intense glance <laughs> And people knew how to interpret those intense glances because yeah. that's how they spoke to each other all the time. Whereas now we've gotten used to hearing people just word vomit and we don't need to understand the intense glances. We're right in the middle of word vomit right now. I know. Yeah. I'm very good at word vomit. So right before the conclusion of this movie, there was a dramatic shift in like how the story was being told. And I think it's because the conclusion of the movie, since these kids were mind readers mm -hmm. and but had these supernatural powers, it relied so heavily on him not thinking about the bomb. <laughs> yes, like, he had to think of a brick wall. Right. And he, you know, he has this, he comes up with this idea, okay, I'm going to think really hard about something else so that they can't see what, what I have. But... In 1960, like, that's not even something that, that movie makers do well now, that whole internal thinking piece. Yeah. And in 1960, they did not know how to show this is happening in this guy's head. Like, yeah. he, we, we are moving from this outside world where the kids are, you know, making people shoot themselves and, you know, causing all this chaos to an inside world where... A man is thinking really hard about one thing to stop himself from thinking about another thing. And all the kids are trying really hard to think about what he's thinking about. Yeah. Well, I liked the um, the overlay where you'd see the brick wall and it was being bashed apart yeah. as he was trying to maintain. That, that was kind of cool. Yes, I agree with you. What I had problems with were before that when they were trying to establish that this was going on where he would like look at something and then look at the brick wall over his fireplace <laughs> yes. and go brick wall and it would zoom in and then he'd look at something else and then go brick wall and it would zoom in i'm like okay you guys i i think we all got it like we understand the symbolism here you don't need to keep beating us over the head with it as if it were a brick wall Ooh. you like what i did there no just kidding, I did. <laughs> oh, good job hiding your thoughts from me. <laughs> Ratings. If I were to rate this movie, comparing it to modern movies, it would get a much lower rating. That's the trouble so, I have. Yeah, it's, it's difficult. But I'm going to give it a little bit of leeway because it is from 1960. And... So not only do I not, not feel like it's really fair to compare it, you know, like CGI-wise and stuff, it's not fair to compare it to movies that came out last year. And also that adds a little something to it. Like, especially for me, because the 60, 1960 is like almost 20 years before I was born. That is a time period that I don't know personally. It was was far enough, we were far enough past it by the time I was aware of myself that... I don't have any memories of that time or anything even close to that time. So that makes it feel uh, very much like a period piece to me. It makes it feel very um, historical in a way. Like, yeah. I know it's not accurate. That's that's not what I mean. But, like, it's a glimpse into a time that I am very unfamiliar with. Yeah. Much like it would be if it were, you know, ancient Egypt. <laughs> <laughs> it's basically the same. <laughs> like, it's the same idea. I'm like, oh, look at how quaint. They're all, you know, the, there's the general store. And, mm -hmm. oh. So I like that aspect of it. I like the premise behind the story. I don't think it was told particularly well. But again, it was told 60 years ago. So, like, our storytelling and what we expect from stories has has changed in those 60 years. All that being said, I'm going to give this movie three sleepy cows out of five. Yeah. Um, there was a lot about it that wasn't great. There were a lot of things about it that I that were very intriguing, but I don't know. I and and it all. You know what? It was very. It was a black and white movie, and like my memories of it are very black and white too. Like yeah. there were the things that I liked or things that I didn't like. There wasn't a lot of in between and it was super short compared to other movies. It was short. So I don't know. Three out of five. 
Okay. Um, speaking of the black and white film, one thing that I found surprising, I mean, I knew this, but seeing it was surprising, was the image quality. Like, this looked great. Like, it was super sharp quality movie. And I was thinking back to when we first got our Buffy DVDs 15 years ago. And that was a show that was like, what, 10 years old when we got the DVDs? And it was garbage. It's just mm-hmm. a muddy mess. And it's that's because of the technology, because they had film negatives for this. And for Buffy, it was just digital, terrible VHS horribleness. Oh, yeah. when we Even when we watch Buffy now, we watch... Yeah. It's, it's so bad. When they're in dark places, like, you literally cannot see what's going on. <laughs> yeah. It's awful. So, I mean, that's just kind of nice that these old movies are high quality. However, that doesn't really affect whether it's a good movie or not. And I was surprised by, like, uh, a lot of the ideas and, like, plot lines to it. Like, I thought it was more modern than I expected. Like, just very clever, inventive ideas to have this, you know, the town falls asleep and they were trying to work out what was going on with it. That's when it was most interesting to me, early in the beginning. When it got to the whole business with the kids, it was like, eh, I didn't Mm -hmm. really care about that so much. So, acting was so bad. I found it quite hilarious on many levels. And um, I don't know. I just, I feel very middle of the road like you, that it's it's got its highs and its lows. And it was not, you know, it's not for me, definitely. I'm going to take it a little lower than you did and give it to two and a half sleepy cows out of five. But, you know, it's, it's not that it's a bad movie. It's just not for me. Mm-hmm. I think part of the problem for me, like I'm sitting here, I feel bad because I feel like my my discussion of it has been so vague. Like I haven't given any real reasons why I didn't like it other than, eh? Yeah. <laughs> but like part of it is the end, like there's the resolution and then it's just bam, the end, done. That's like there was no, there was no wrapping it up. There was no like, how does the village recover from this how do how do the people in washington feel about how their problem has been solved for them by an explosion like nothing it was just literally like boom roll credits Mm -hmm. and that was like i still like i'm looking at my notes and i have all these elaborate notes and then all of a sudden it just goes brick wall boom and done like i'm just like okay well and even before you get to the actual the end like that entire end sequence is very sudden and out mm-hmm. of the blue. Like we built up all this story and then it's just like, I think I'm going to go make a bomb and blow him up. And, and he had the bomb component. Like if this was a Stephen King story, he would have spent days working out, you know, getting all the parts and making his bomb and carefully hiding it. And it, it would be an elaborate process that yeah. is realistic. And this guy had a bomb in his desk drawer. <laughs> And an alarm clock to hook it up, too. I mean, to be fair, his bomb was basically a stick of dynamite and an alarm clock. <laughs> Why is there dynamite in his desk? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. It wasn't necessarily dynamite. An explosive, an alarm clock, and some wire. Yeah. Yeah. Why did he have that in his desk? He was a scientist, man. Mm, that is very scientific. All right. Well, um, I, I'm happy that we watched a classic. True classic. But... I'm hoping for something a little peppier the next time. I hope the peppy thing you're looking for is total garbage because that's what I'm looking for. Hi, Zoli. Hi, Mikey. I'm here talking to you on the microphone. On the mic, mic, microphone. Wicka, wicka, wicka.